nothing's happening because I didn't hit the button for anything to happen. There we go. Now things are happening. Oh, it's starting to cool off and my basement's getting cold again. Oh, it's all still right. warm here for now. Yeah, it, today was beautiful. It was like 55 and it was really, it was nice out. The wind d- died down because we had, uh, I had nothing but rain from like midday Friday through yesterday. And one of my neighbors had a tree go down. It was it was something else. But today was was real nice. But my basement gets cold and then my hands start getting cold. Alrighty. Um so I am uh I'm ready to go if you are. Um did you have anything uh before we got started? You wanted to, how do you want to be introduced? I guess would be a better question. SP is fine. Okay. That will work. Um so I will play an intro. Um, short intro clip. I'll introduce us both. We'll just talk for however, however long we decide to go. Um, and then, uh, wrap it up, give you a chance to plug anything you want and, uh, we'll call it a night. We usually somewhere around an hour, but it just depends on the conversation. Okay. Sounds good. All righty. Well, in that case, then <clears throat> let me get over here and click this record button and we are going to get started in three, two, one. Ah. Let me see your head, Jimbo. See if you got any creepy crawlers. I need to make a telephone call. Uh, got to take it to a doctor, Jimbo. Can't make no calls till the doctor says. It's very important what you got to do, Jimbo. Let's take it easy. Relax into things. And we'll all get along fine. We'll just relax. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is Wait, You Haven't Seen? And it's a show where we talk about movies, and specifically, we talk about a movie at least one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. This is episode number 191, and the movie this week is 1995's 12 Monkeys, and joining me to talk about it is SP, and how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and the farther I get away from having to watch this mess, the better off that I'm getting. (laughs) I feel like we're going to have a dis- divided opinion on this movie. I can see Probably. this is, I can I can not, somewhat see where this is going. <laughs> not necessarily the IP, but definitely the movie is not the finest work of those involved. All righty. Well, um so you had never seen this before, but were you familiar with the movie or some something about it at all prior to watching? I watched the Yeah, I watched the 2015 sci-fi series 12 Monkeys. So I had the basis for everything that was going on, and unfortunately, the movie just fell a lot short. Uh, but surprisingly to me, because I don't really love everything that's on the Sci-Fi Network, but this show, the Twelve Monkeys show on Sci-Fi, was way better than this movie, which is shocking to me. Okay, so that's interesting, and I definitely want to want to touch on that a little bit more. Um, before we get there, though. Are you a Terry Gilliam fan in terms of films? Are you familiar with his work uh, outside of this I movie? Up, I looked up some of his work, and I didn't remember too much that he did. Um, Might need Python. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than that, you know, I know serious stuff. That and So I kind of glossed over everything. What did I miss? Uh, so he did um, Time Bandits was was his oh, back yes. in the eighties. Uh, Brazil was a movie that he did. The Fisher King, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas um, is one that he did. The Brothers Grimm with Matt Damon and Heath Ledger um, is another one of his, which isn't his strongest movie, but uh, it is definitely one. So he's a he's an interesting director. Uh, as you mentioned, he got started in uh, Monty Python was kind of his first his rise to fame. He was the um, the token American in the group uh, who ended up moving to uh, England and, and living there um, anyway. But he uh, he was responsible for all of the interstitials with the cutout animation. That was all him. So anytime they'd go between segments and they had all that weird, just crazy animation with the big foot and all that, that was all Terry Gilliam stuff. He basically did mostly that and would show up for occasional sketches. Um, and that's how he got started, and then he moved into directing, and he co-directed uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail with Terry Jones. 
before going off on his own and starting to do his own movies. He is a, uh, a unique person, I will say, uh, very opinionated, uh, but has a very distinct vision for film. So I wonder if that plays into comparing that with the series. Um, now, I have not seen the series, I will say that. It, it just sort of, as much as I like this movie, I did not have a... Um, an opportunity to see that. And it's, it's one that's always been on my list of like, I need to watch the 12 monkey series and then something else catches my attention or I have something else to do for a show. And I forget, uh, I forget about it for like six months at a time, but I am a big fan of Terry Gilliam, uh, in his, it, I should say his, his movies. Um, he can be a little grating. He's kind of, he's one of those that is, uh, he's got very strong opinions and he makes sure that you know his opinion on stuff and it's not always great. But um, but his visual, his directing, I've always been a fan of. So it's very interesting to say see that you didn't glom onto that. Um, how would you compare, having seen both, how would you compare this with the series? What was it about the series that worked a lot more for you than this movie did? There were a lot of similarities in the storyline, but there were marked differences that made it way better, sometimes subtle. Dr. Ray Rayleigh was a virologist in the TV show versus a psychiatrist in okay. the movie. I think a lot of the insanity stuff, the play up of the mental health really did a disservice to the, not mental health, but did a disservice to the story. Yes, they had some issues with early test subjects coming mm -hmm. back raving mad. They So they referenced the issues that they were having in the movie from that point. But they also went into the Splinter Project, which was the time travel that allowed all this to happen. Okay. Whereas in the movie, you didn't get any of it. You just got this big tube that the guy went into and then <laughs> whoop, he's gone. You got a little bit more. So the movie, the, the TV show was set in 2043. At least that's where it started. Okay. And it started in 2013 even though it aired in 2015 it started in 2013 so it was 30 years difference that didn't change but the time frame that it was filmed in changed so you got to spend a lot of time in 2043 to see what had happened to everything in the future where mm -hmm. you got nothing above ground in the film whatsoever sure and the whole thing about the virus was flipped on its side for hmm. the TV show versus the movie, whereas it was kind of a, almost a, a non-plot subplot in the film. It was the main plot. You were actually going after the virus and to prevent the destruction of the world and stuff like that. And hmm. It was before the pandemic. The TV show finished before the pandemic, so there was sure. no pandemic influence on it whatsoever. Kind of like Contagion, the, the film Contagion. Right. But there was a lot of what you would think were similarities to the coronavirus pandemic in there as well. So you had a lot of that. The character Jose was flushed out. Kirk Acevedo played Jose, and Ooh. that's a main character. Nice. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. Yeah, and it wasn't a bunch of crazy people. It was actually sane people trying to figure out what was going on. So that made a difference as well. The filming style wasn't as, I don't know. I, I didn't like the sideways camera or the diagonal camera. I didn't care for that. The deep drooling. I didn't care for that. I'm, I'm not a great big Brad Pitt fan to begin with. Mm. And then his character just fed into that to me. I'm like, okay, you're just way, way crazy. And I don't think it was Bruce Willis' strongest role. Matter of fact, even though he's a good actor, even though he did time travel with Looper, even though he has all these accomplishments with sci-fi, Fifth Element, it just didn't pull off for me. Okay. I I, you're making me want to watch the series more because I love Kirk Acevedo. So having him play the Jose character and getting more of that character, I'm all for that. Uh, I've loved him since I saw him. I remember him in Oz, but I really fell in love with Acevedo in Fringe. Um, he was in the first couple seasons of that. And uh, so that's really cool. So it, it's funny because I have almost the exact opposite takes on a lot of this. Now, I saw the movie first. So 
that's going to color my uh, interpretations of it quite a bit differently in that you came from, you saw the series and then you go back and you see this movie and it sounds like they're, they're quite different in tone in, in the story. They're telling the same story, but in a very different way. So I can a hundred percent see how this would be something that just doesn't feel right and feels very off putting. Terry Gilliam's style is to be somewhat ambiguous um, this is not my favorite of his movies. My favorite is Brazil, which is got a same, uh, a very similar tone to it where, um, you're not quite sure exactly what's real and what isn't. And he sort of plays around with that idea of the ambiguity and how, how, uh, reliable is our narrator and our main character? Because in this movie, it's all from kind of James Cole's perspective, Bruce Willis's character. And so, it's funny that you mentioned like you see much more of the world in the future, um, which is something that they kind of purposely didn't do in this. But when I'm watching the movie, it's like I want to know more and I want to expand on that. So it's cool that they did that in the series. Um, it sounds like the series is doing exactly what I say in a lot of these really ambitious sci-fi movies, which is make it into a series and, and continue on with the world. I remember saying that when I first saw um, the animated movie Titan A.E., was the same thing. I was like, I would love to see a series set in this world because it's fascinating and we only see this little slice of it. And that's kind of how I've always felt about 12 Monkeys where it's like, we're seeing this tiny little part of the future, but only from this guy's perspective because we only ever see him in what, like a jail cell or uh, a hospital bed or in front of that group of scientists. And it's all, it's just all ambiguous. You don't know anything. No, nobody in the future has a name except for Jose. Um, the scientists are just called the scientists. And so I kind of, I like the idea of expanding on that, but Gilliam has this thing where he like purposely wanted the movie to not have a, a clean wrap up. Um, and you sort of could interpret it as like, well, maybe this guy really is just completely nuts and none of this is real, but everything is given to you. Like it's completely a hundred percent real. So, it's weird. Gil that that's just a, a Terry Gilliam filmmaking thing. He does a lot of that stuff. Brazil had famously kind of a false ending that then brings you back and like, oh, the real ending is this. He actually fought hardcore with the studio back in the eighties, who released his movie with a different cut. So when he went to work for Universal again for this movie, he demanded that he have final cut. And they said, Sure, you can have final cut for this movie. But you got to make it for $30 million. You can't go over budget, and uh, we want Bruce Willis in it. So he agreed to that and uh, and got to make this movie. Um, it's fascinating that, uh, that like, the virus is the main focus because I feel like the virus in this is the MacGuffin, right? It's the thing that's moving the plot along, if you can call what's in this movie, like, a plot. It's Because it's not your standard sort of A to B to C plot. It's, like, A to Q to who knows where, and then I'll oh, just give up on that. And we'll, we'll play over here for a little while. And like, it's, it's weird, almost art housey in a way. And when you think about the fact, or when you, when you learn that this was based on, and you may have seen it in the opening credits where it said it was inspired by the film Le Jeté. That is about as art house a movie as you can get. It was a French film. I want to say it came out in the 1960s. It's only like 20 minutes long and it's all still shots. There's, there's no movement at all in the movie, but it, it's a story about a post-apocalyptic world where they're sending people back in time um, and kind of the fallout from that. So coming from that and then you incorporate somebody like Terry Gilliam, who is just a, uh, an out there director, I can see where it's just an odd thing, especially coming from something that got to expand that story so much. You really, I really want to watch this series. I might have to start this. Is it? Do you know, uh, so it was a sci-fi series, right? Sci-fi channel? Yeah, it's on Hulu right now. It is. Okay, excellent. I have Hulu. So All four I... seasons. I think there are four seasons, yeah. Oh, wow. So I turned it on as a palate cleanser to this whole <laughs> thing. to like Because I hadn't seen it since it aired. So I was sure. like, oh, yeah, yep, yep. I am not misremembering it. This is much better. No, it's not like the finest bit of television ever. Mm -hmm. But you take the show and... They take aspects of the show. For instance, the final scene, right? When Dr. What is his name? Not Dr. Peters. I Dr. Think Peters. Is his name, yeah. Right. 
Yep. He so he's on the plane and he sits down next to that insurance agent who said her name is Jones. Mm -hmm. One of the lead scientist in the tv series is dr jones yeah it's a woman it's a strong character and it was taken straight from there goins the brad pitt character yep. was gender flip and given a strong actor a strong character there and what they did with the entire thing is just leaps and bounds above what this is now you might say okay so they had four seasons and the movie was only two hours and six minutes you know obviously you're gonna do a better job i think the unreliable narrator it's a strong story plot device mm -hmm. i understand that but it completely just mind warps you to the point <laughs> of what is going on they did none of the cause and effect for the time travel whatsoever they explore that in the series to actually tell you you're going back and forth and like you said maybe the unreliable narrative in the film was he was crazy that he wasn't going back and forth but i like the story better the other way sure where it is a reliable narrator where you do go back and forth one scene in the movie theater in the film that I really enjoyed was when Bruce was talking. I think it was Bruce. He was James Colt. He was talking about seeing the movie different times yep. and that the movie didn't actually change, but that you as a person have changed and your perspective of the film has changed. And I'll give you a recent example for that. I am a huge mm -hmm. Kelly Preston fan. Okay. Just love her to death. And one of my favorite movies was For the Love of the Game. It's a great date movie because there's a guy stuff in there. There's girl stuff in there. Sure. And I had given the movie a pass for quite some time because of that. You're like, you have the supernatural power where he's clearing the mechanism. So he's able to pitch this perfect game or able to pitch without the crowd yeah. that's around him, whatever. And he had this love story going on. I was like, yeah, okay, this is really cool. I watched it again for the first time in a couple of years. And I'm watching Kevin Costner be this giant dick to Kelly Preston for the first time in my life. And I'm like, okay, I could see why people didn't really love this because his character is based on a dick character. And I never seen that because I was always rooting for the hero. Mm -hmm. Like he's at the end of his career. He's a weary pitcher. They've got the baseball commentators saying everything. And it, it just feels like an emotional thing. And I was a, just a fanboy about that but then i watched it you know i'm over 50 now and i'm watching it like kevin you're just a dick <laughs> you need to like lay off this poor woman who's just trying to be there for you and you're just pushing her away and being a dick so that's me watching it for the first time after seeing it dozens of times before sure. so i i get what bruce is saying you know you're watching life events pass you by like a movie and you're just seeing it from a different perspective i thought that was a very powerful message that mm -hmm. i took so i did take something positive from the, the <laughs> film here was that scene and and i love that you pointed that out because that was one in my notes when i was watching it this time around like i really love that moment because i feel that like in my soul uh, I talk a lot about movies uh, with a lot of different people, and that is one thing that I have noticed is there are certain there are, you going into a movie, whether it's your expectations of the movie or your preconceived notions or or whatever you bring into a movie watching experience completely changes watching that movie. The example that I like to give from my, me personally is uh, a movie called Event Horizon. It came out in 1997. Um, I saw it in the theater when it came out, did not like it the first time at all because I had no, I was not prepared for what it was um, because it, it, all the marketing was for a sci-fi kind of dark sci-fi adventure thing. And it turned into a, just a crazy haunted house horror movie. And I wasn't prepared for that. I watched it again a few years later. I had, cho I had not only was I more prepared for it, but I had changed over the years um, and and sort of changed how I looked at movies. And suddenly I really liked what they were telling, the story that they were telling, but I wasn't blindsided by it. And I had more years of kind of life experience to sort of frame how I look at something. Um, another one, just recently I rewatched um, The House on Haunted Hill, the remake version. 
not the not the old Vincent Price one, but uh, the one from '99, realizing that's a better kind of horribly cheesy late '90s horror movie than it had any right to be. And when I first saw it, I was younger and I just didn't it didn't connect. And it's not good by any stretch, but there was something I appreciated about it more watching it again um, as I got older and sort of changed how I view movies versus sort of the younger version of me. So it's really cool that you noticed that in this movie and picked that line out too, because that was one I captured and I just love the delivery of it. And it's so, it, it really is a great way of a great kind of a philosophical thing of like, yeah, you, you change throughout your life, but the things around you don't necessarily change. Like it's still the same. And for C- James Cole in this movie, he's, he's literally witnessing because they keep showing that, um, does the dream play into a lot of stuff where he's having the dream of himself as a kid in the airport, or is that not, not as much played? Into no, it? there's no, I don't remember completely. So here's your unreliable narrator. For me. <laughs> okay. But, I don't think there was a memory of him in the airport. I think there was some memories when he was younger. And then also they ran into some time travel rules. Like you couldn't go past your own lifespan. So Mm. in the film, he could go back to World War I, but he wasn't alive in World War I, so he couldn't go back that far. I think they got around that once or twice, and I can't remember how they did. But the entire thing with uh Rayleigh and James Cole they were an item in mm-hmm. the series but I don't think it was like a, a start and the end and then also with the series you kind of remember these showrunners never knew how long they were going to actually get like are we going to end at season two are we going to end at season three are we going to end at season four how are we going to actually wrap this up and then each season how do we take it to the next level so they're going completely off the page by oh, the sure. end of the, uh, the series because they just didn't know anything so no i don't remember this airport scene over and over and even if they did i think it would have been limited to the first season and then before we get completely off of it let me just say one other experience that i've had i kind of backed into this movie because i did watch the series first Mm -hmm. before i watched the movie the only other thing that i can remember that can equate to maybe a lot of people out there is if you take a look at the starship troopers film the people that read the book Mm -hmm. hated the film by large part i mean there's probably some exceptions out there but the people that saw the film and had no idea what was in the book enjoyed the film for what the film was yep so maybe they went back to read the book and got more of what was going on in the book or not but that's the general feeling that i got of starship troopers is the people that enjoyed it didn't have the background yet the people that had the background didn't enjoy it so that's just an example yeah and and i've seen that plenty of times too uh i had a friend of mine who was a huge and probably still is Robert Ludlum fan loved Robert Ludlum's books so he the the born series um the born identity supremacy all of those um and he and I went and saw the born supremacy in the theater and he sat in that theater for 2 hours seething with anger over that movie because he had read the book. He loved them so much. And within like five minutes of the start of the movie, it diverges from the book almost completely. And he just, he couldn't handle it after that. And he almost, I'm, I'm surprised he sat through the whole thing. Um, whereas I hadn't read those books yet. So my only real complaint was, Hey, pull the camera back just a little bit from the action. I'm getting seasick because it was, <laughs> it was very early Paul Greengrass and everything was up close and handheld. And it's like, let's, let's smooth that out a little bit. It's tough to tell what is happening anywhere. But yeah, I, I, Starship Troopers is a great one because I didn't read the book. I saw the movie and it's fine. I had no problems with it at all. But then I read the book later uh, for a class I did in college and realized, oh, that's why everybody hated that movie that I talked to. And that happens a lot with novels too. Ad- adapting a story from page to screen, it's not the same storytelling medium, right? So like you have to do things differently. Now, sometimes you can completely change things. Uh, Blade Runner is a good example where Blade Runner has some of the same 
core concepts as the novel do androids dream of electric sheep but they're very different um and so if you come at something from this idea of like i read this book and i really like this book and then they make a movie about it and it's not the same as the book you're probably not going to like that um so it, it it does kind of come back to sort of what i was saying where it's like you bring all this stuff with you when you see a movie or you read a book and it's always going to be unique to you so it does make me wonder had you seen this movie prior to the series how different that experience would be not so much would you like it or not but how what like what level of uh like or dislike would you have for the movie 12 monkeys if you didn't have the better memory of what the series told for that story and how that hit you better uh when you saw this for the first time because it sounds like and and it's what i say a lot which is you take an ambitious story and you spread it out over more time and you can dive into things more for instance changing uh the character of of dr rayleigh to a a virologist from a psychiatrist that's interesting because it sounds like they don't play as much with the mental instabilities of time travel at all. Um, no, no, not really. Like there were, there were a couple of, of test subjects before James Cole that mm-hmm. just went crazy when they came back. So there was a little bit of, we need to get the specific DNA or the specific compatibility with okay. what is called the splinter project so that you could travel back and forth without going insane. Gotcha. So it's sort it's almost like um, the movie version of James Cole was that precursor in some ways, because that was one of the things I found interesting in the movie is Bruce Willis's performance. I liked because he gets to flip around from being like when he first travels and he shows up in in whatever time it is, whether it's 1990 or 1996, He's disoriented. He doesn't quite know what's going on yet. He's not not fully, like, all the cylinders aren't quite firing. Um, and when he goes back to the whatever, I think it's, tw- it never says it in the movie, but the trivia that uh, I've read over the years is like 2035 is the, the time frame. Um, he's, same thing. When he arrives, it's he's a little, like, everything's dulled. He's not quite as sharp as he should be. Um, and if he has enough time to stay in one time period, it sort of it smooths out. Because if you the the scene where he's in front of all of the doctors um, at the asylum the first time, he's very composed for a majority of that. Very different from the kind of drooling, raving, crazy guy that he was before. And so it's like if he has enough time after the time travel, it's sort of everything can level back out and he gets set. But it's that that act of going from one time period to another, however that's done, which also is a thing that the movie just hand waves away. Like they just time travel. They don't give us any, and it sounds like the the series does dive into that. It does. It's a whole project that the scientists run into. It's called project splinter. I won't spoil anything, but there is an entity that is mankind's last hope where they're trying to reverse this whole thing. Mm. And, they do it through trying to create this project splinter. I think everybody dies around it. I, this is like in the first episode, so I'm not really spoiling okay. anything. And so a surviving group of military and scientists take it over and then they reconstruct not only how this thing works, but then how to actually target, you know, how to use it. Like, how are we going to prevent all this from happening? Because everybody's had this terrible loss, you know, they've mm. lost. 7 billion people because the Earth's population has grown since the uh, 5 billion people in the movie to now 7 billion people. So it's 7 billion people. So, yeah, they're trying to bring back loved ones. They're trying to make it so it never happened. They're trying to make their pain over the last 30 years go away because this all didn't have to happen. Let's go back and fix it. And that is what they're doing. Also, let me go back to the mental instability of Bruce Willis. Sure. Bruce Willis, he has a lot of strong points with his acting. Playing a crazy person is not his strong point, or maybe it's not how he's viewed as a strong point. Take the fifth element, for example. There is crazy going all around him, and he keeps his composure. 
He keeps his wits around him. Mm -hmm. He devises a plan. He executes the plan as best as he can. And in this, him being drugged just takes that whole thing away. And you get to see a side of him that I'm glad he got to play, Mm -hmm. but it's just not his strong suit. And honestly, if I was his family, I would not want him remembered for that role because it is not his finest moment. I can I can understand that. I I liked the vulnerability that he brought to it. So he was um he originally met Terry Gilliam when he auditioned for Terry Gilliam's movie in 1991 called The Fisher King. And he wanted to play the radio shock jock that eventually went to Jeff Bridges. Um in that movie. And Gilliam liked him. Uh he actually liked a scene he had done in Die Hard. There's the scene in Die Hard where he's pulling the glass out of his feet and he's talking about his wife. And apparently a good majority of that was kind of made up on the spot. Um, and Terry Gilliam was like, that was just a cool scene, and I really liked that. And when he learned that it was ad-libbed, uh, Gilliam kind of remembered that. So even though he didn't cast him in Fisher King, he was excited to work with him in this and kind of let him play some more of that so that that aspect of things, that more vulnerability. Because at this point, Bruce Willis was very much known as the action star. By this stage in his career, he was a bankable star, which is why Universal Pictures wanted him in this movie, um, so that they get that kind of opening weekend push from having a Bruce Willis movie. And it is very different for him um, because you're right. I think it was the next year actually was was uh, Fifth Element. I think came out the year after this, and so he's a different. He's a totally different character in that he is. Uh, Corbin Dallas is always like level he's got he's got things under control no matter what insanity is going on around him no matter how many uh times he has to listen to chris tucker scream (laughs) in that movie um he keeps it together and james cole i think it's because there's that idea again of that kind of fracturing of the mind as that travels through time um i don't know it's it's an interesting like thought uh to it and sort of he as he as the movie progresses, he goes from very earnestly believing in the future and the virus and all of these things to he gets to a point where I love his line when they're in the hotel room and he says, I want the future to be unknown. Like he's burdened with this knowledge of what's happening and can't do anything about it and all he wants is for it to be unknown. So he's willing to kind of run down the rabbit hole of maybe I am crazy uh, to get away from sort of that, the the reality of where he's from. And I thought that was really, really something to explore. Um, I also noticed in the first 15 minutes of this movie, they wanted to show him naked a lot because we got the two different shots of him being showered uh, and then drooling. He drools a lot in this movie too, uh, which... Not not great to look at because it's like it's not just a little bit of drool. It's like hanging to the floor. I'm I don't know how they pulled that off other than just making him drink a whole bunch of water and then it was It wasn't just him. Brad Pitt did it too. And I just I just liked it on both of them. I was like, this is if you're if you're showing these two strong main character actors and you're showing them like that, it's like I don't I don't come to the movie to watch this. I I don't. Now this and was you're showing it to me. This was um Brad Pitt was actually nominated for an Academy Award or for best supporting actor for this role. And this so when he was cast and when they were filming this, um he was still not quite Brad Pitt yet. He was coming he was up and coming. He had done a few movies, but he wasn't the star that he was. While they were filming this and before it released is when Legends of the Fall and Seven both came out, and those were those really rocketed him. So he's suddenly a much bigger star by the time this hit. Um, his performance in this is just manic and crazy and out there, and he's just, like, going for it, um, which I'm fine with. I, but I also I, I like Brad Pitt. I think that he's just a very charismatic actor, and so... I love to see somebody just have fun with a role and you can kind of tell he's having fun with that sort of he, as he's aged, he's gotten to a point of, of having more fun on screen. It looks like I just saw him recently in the movie bullet train. And in that he's playing kind of a, 
he's an aging uh, hitman of some kind. So he's he's a hitman, but now he's in his fifties and he's kind of rethinking his life and he wants to kind of go along more of a uh, a path of nonviolence, but he's still doing jobs. And so it's it's just there's, there's a lot of uh, deadpan and sarcasm in it, and he's having a lot of fun with that role. And I like to see that. And this was one of those roles where he's just having fun, like he basically gets to do whatever he wants and act out. And I have to think for an actor, that can be kind of a a freeing thing to just be able to go nuts on it too. There's also, uh, whether it's true or not, the story that Terry Gilliam took his cigarettes away from him while they were filming to make him more manic, (laughs) which I don't know that I believe it, but at the same time with the stories from Terry Gilliam that I've heard and seen in documentaries, I kind of want to believe it because he would do that. Um, I'm biased. I'm not a big Brad Pitt fan to begin with. However, I didn't like the drooling. Same with Bruce Willis. I think it was a disservice to both of those guys to do it. I know, you know, if they're leaning into the mental health thing and unreliable narratives, I could see why they wanted to show it, but it's just, I don't think it was necessary to show it on screen. Him acting like the crazy goings. That was fine as an actor like i i didn't mm-hmm. like brad pitt but the crazy goings okay i could see that because again coming off of the series jennifer goings is crazy she turns out to be incredibly intelligent but she's crazy and i could see the similarities there between the two roles the fact that it didn't have anything to do with anything other than let the animals go is <laughs> is like okay so you, you had this crazy plot going on that had nothing to do with what was actually going on with dr peters it was the misdirect there i think was a too big of a jump for me but brad pitt good crazy he can he can definitely do that i think also aesthetically the contact that he wore in the one eye helped because that made him just look is even odder because his one eye is 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 just so off and it makes his face look weird and you mentioned you didn't like the the angles and the dutch tilts that they do in this and that is something i don't like overuse of them uh which some directors can do and terry gilliam definitely does a lot of wide angle lenses up very close so everything is distorted um and a lot of tilts. And I think the reason that for me in this movie it worked is because this movie is meant to have you never quite feel comfortable with what's going on on the screen and never quite fully grasp what's happening. And so all of that stuff plays into it. The tilting the camera, moving it around in weird ways, getting way up close on somebody with a wide angle lens so their faces, their nose gets really distorted and all of that. It's it's all done with a purpose to to make you feel disoriented, and so for me, I like that personally. Um, okay, it's okay for a little bit of the movie for me, five, ten, maybe fifteen minutes, but for all two hours and six <laughs> minutes, no. I wanted to actually ground myself at some point in the entire story, and we get none of it. Yeah, it it, it does feel like this movie. This movie itself is less about the story of what's happening than sort of following James Cole and what he's going through and seeing it all from his perspective instead of following the virus and what's happened in the future and why he's going back. They give you the reasons, but they don't focus on those reasons. That's that almost feels secondary in the movie um, to sort of what Gilliam was trying to get across, which is like stuff's weird and you know, here's here's a weird movie. Enjoy it, um, or not. Uh, and and it's kind of that's that's sort of what Terry Gilliam does. Um, he just kind of is this like really out there artist, uh, or that's how he sees himself. And so, a lot of actors like to work with him. I know uh, Willis uh, and Madeline Stowe, who we haven't really talked about a whole lot of her performance as uh, Catherine Rayleigh, and her name's different in the series, right? It's Cassandra, I think. I think so. Um, But they took pay cuts because they wanted to work with Terry Gilliam. That was sort of a big thing for them at the time. Um, He's, 
he's not as in demand of a of a director anymore. Um, but I know it was a couple years after this he did Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with Benicio del Toro and Johnny Depp, uh, and uh, they they also really wanted to work on. That's another weird one. If you don't like Twelve Monkeys, I I don't recommend Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas because it's a lot of that same sort of visual style, um, and it per it kind of progresses throughout the whole thing. Um, but that's also a movie about, uh, drug addicts, um, taking, taking all sorts of drugs. So again, it sort of fits the narrative of what Gilliam, like the vision of what he has for the story, but it's not, it doesn't make sense in terms of like, we're telling you a story here it is and watch it unfold as much as it is. Here's an experience, experience this with us. And I think that is the biggest difference I'm getting from the series, which expanding on this story because I I think from from a writing aspect the concepts in this script are really interesting in this idea of of uh, you know fatalism determination uh, here's James Cole keeps going back in time trying to fix things and we don't see any of the ripple effect of that and usually time travel movies do that right if something changes in the past you see that change in the future the closest we get to that is Jose showing up at the end at the airport in the movie um, and telling him, hey, we just got your, you know, we got your message. I'm here to help in handing him the pistol and then the woman on the plane um, because she's one of the scientists in the future. And so you can, you can interpret that as they got the information enough to send her back, maybe, or it's the her from that, that current year and she just happened to run into him. Could kind of go either way, and that's, again, that ambiguity. Um, I like to think that maybe they figured something out and they sent her back, but because we never get any kind of resolution and uh, to the story, it's left open-ended. I know when I was younger, I definitely assumed, oh, no, this is Dr. Peters meeting her on the plane as he's going out to spread the virus everywhere. And basically everything that happened in the movie didn't change anything. The virus still happens. Um, it was already out at that point. By the time he, Dr. Peters gets in the plane, the virus is already happening. So that's a conundrum in of itself because Dr. Jones has been uh, subjugated to it. Mm-hmm. She's already been exposed to it. Yeah. And it's the, <laughs> it's the problem with anything time travel related is if you – if you think about it long enough, you're going to find all the, the plot holes and the issues um, with any kind of time travel movie. But I, I'm i going to come back to it. I really want to watch this series now and see this world expanded because the closest we got to that was when Cole goes to the surface at the beginning of the movie in the really crazy clear plastic suit and the body condom that he's wearing uh, and collecting samples. And you get the shots of like the lion on top of the library and the bear and all of that. Um, that costume was also, uh, those costumes were also nominated for Academy Awards. I remember that because I remember watching the Oscars that year. And they had, for some reason that year, when they announced who was up for best costumes, they would bring people out in the costumes from that from the movie. And so I just remember seeing a bunch of people, like two or three people wearing these same clear plastic, like bubble helmet things walking around on the stage in the Oscars thinking, and I hadn't seen the movie at this point. I'm like, what in the world is that movie about? Because that is weird looking. So, but I do, looking back at it, I love the costume because I just think it's, it's something that you remember. Yeah, I was taking a look at the costume going, you know, LEDs would make that a lot easier better these days and of course oh, yeah. we have class i believe they're class four clear suits now clean suits now that maybe five that actually are designed for everything but this was the mid 90s so not necessarily we weren't progressed in our virology yeah as much as we are today and it's even before the pandemic so interestingly enough we've been referencing you know, the movies of the year and some of the other movies that were out. Mm-hmm. I did go into box office mojo and brought up 1995 movies. There's 282 movies that came out that year in the theater, according to box office mojo. 12 monkeys is number 13 of 
the box office for that year. Mm -hmm. Number one was Toy Story. Number two is Apollo 13. Three, Batman Forever. Four, Pocahontas. Five, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. Six, Goldeneye. Seven, Jumanji. Eight, Casper. Nine is seven. Ten, Die Hard with a Vengeance. So a little bit of Bruce Willis there too. Crimson Tide is 11. Waterworld is number 12. And then 12 Monkeys. And then right underneath there, Dangerous Minds, Mr. Holl Holland's Opus, While You Were Sleeping, Congo, uh, Father of the Bride 2, and then Braveheart rounds out so, the top 19. So it did pretty good in the box office for that year. It So two things from that list uh, that I take away from it. Number one, uh, 95 was a pretty good year for a lot of movies. The, and, a, and a fairly diverse um, look at movies. But... Waterworld was a lot more of a box office draw than people like you always hear people talk about how it was kind of a flop. Well, it was a flop relative to how much it cost at the time, but it made money. Um, but this movie definitely made money. It was uh, worldwide just shy of one hundred and seventy million dollars, which in 1995 is a lot different of a box office draw than, say, now. Right. Um, but that's pretty good on a movie that cost under 30 million to make. Um, so it was a, this was a popular movie. It was up for, uh, Academy Awards. It did not, I don't think it won, uh, any, uh, it was just nominated for several. Um, I will double check that. Uh, oh, uh, nominated for two. Okay. So, uh, it was costumes and Brad Pitt. It didn't win either one. Um, which is a little bit of a bummer, but, uh, Brad Pitt wasn't quite the name that he is. Um, and so he, he grew into his acting, I do think, um, whether you, and and I know you said you're not a, a big fan of his. I wasn't until I saw Seven, uh, but I wasn't a big fan of like the heart throb stuff, the Legends of the Fall at the time. Watching it now, I actually appreciate that movie a lot more um, than I did. Kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, but this was, uh, yeah, this was a surprisingly uh, profitable movie, um, and uh, it doesn't look like it would be. Like watching it now, because it feels like kind of an odd art house thing. But this got a wide release and it did fairly well. Um, I'd remiss if I don't mention that Frank Gorshin is in this for a very small part um, as the, the doctor. And I don't know what it is about him in this movie, but there's something like he's playing this, this doctor. He's odd. But there's also something kind of cool about him in the way that he moves. I can't explain it. When he, there's this, the, and what made me think of it, uh, and I had, I wanted to mention this was there's a shot of him when he's talking to Dr. Rayleigh in the office, and she's starting to believe Cole. She's starting to like question everything that's going on, and he grabs a cigarette, and when he goes to put it in his mouth, there's just something with the way he just kind of does that and sort of nonchalantly like sets the cigarette in his mouth and grabs the lighter. I was just like. Man, Frank Gorshin just looks cool in this movie. I can't figure out what it is. It's the same guy who made this really weird noise with his mouth earlier in the movie, too. Which I might have uh, captured audio of when I was when I was watching it because it was just <laughs> I'm like, what is what is he doing exactly? Um, that weird thinking thing that he was doing. Um, here's a question for you: In the series, does he run into other time travelers? Yes, okay. but if I'm remembering correctly, there's only one time traveler device. Hmm. So, and and there's an unreliable narrator for you as well, because I, I kind of remember there was a backup somewhere, and I don't know if they got it running or not. Hmm, okay. Or maybe, maybe the Prime one got uh, taken over or something like that. But yes, there's there's definitely other agents out there while they're time traveling that's a it's a big good versus evil sort oh, okay. of motif that they've got going because the evil people want to keep things the way they are <laughs> and the good people want to save everybody save the planet so to speak so and honestly it's like the blip in the marvel cinematic universe you go five years without people and then they come back and it's like we've lived for five years without you mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do now? People have moved on. We thought you were gone. We thought yeah. you were dead. Mm -hmm. We've grieved for the most part. I know some people in in the movies and the TV shows that Disney Plus 
they some people have issues with the people that have left and mm -hmm. maybe some people take their own lives or maybe some people get sick and die of cancer while they're waiting for everybody else to come back even though they don't they don't know that people are coming back but right so it's very similar to that in okay. terms of where your modern movie gober might be thinking right in terms of there's 30 years of stuff that's happened. Yeah. There's 30 years of cannibalism. There's 30 years of people beating the crap out of other people just to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to go back on all that. You're there there's good stuff that happened too and you're going to yep. go back on that too. It's tough when you think about time travel to go back to fix something where so much time has progressed. Yeah. And I, the reason I ask is the like number one, all of that kind of stuff is really fascinating, and that's the kind of thing that a, a series can can look at more because you just have more time. You have more time to to ask those questions. Uh, but also in this movie, did you catch that the uh, the street preacher that recognizes him um, when they're walking down the street and the guy says, "Hey, you're one of us," the guy that was just like kind of yelling yeah. at everybody. That guy was also in Catherine Rayleigh's um, presentation earlier in the movie when she was talking about back in whatever ancient time it was that was the same face. And I was like, oh, I don't because I, I don't know what had I had I ever really made that connection before um, where I realized, oh, that's the same person. And here's another one of your time travelers because they do have like that weird disembodied voice that Cole hears. Um, that no one else seems to hear, which um, is what is going on with Bob. You mentioned Titan AE before, and I've always had this fondness for the name Bob because planet Bob, but this yeah. Bob in this movie, it's like, what is going on with Bob? Well, and what's so confusing about it is Cole hears his voice. And then later on, he runs into a bum on the street that has the same voice and knows him and is telling him about their tracking you in your teeth and all this kind of stuff. And then he hears the the disembodied voice again later, but then she runs into the same homeless man who now has no clue about any of that. And so it very it's very confusing because if it's uh if it's part of his own psychosis, how did she know about it? Type of thing. But then if it's not part of his psychosis, why did the guy not know who he was years later or, or a few months later or whatever it's supposed to be? It's it is very confusing. I will give you that. Um in that it's it's hard to kind of keep track of. There's the flashes of the one guard who will just show up in present day for like two seconds coming up the escalator in the wrong direction or uh, when he's trying to get on the elevator uh, when he's making his escape and he looks back at the guy sitting at the desk reading the newspaper and it's the, it's the guard from the future telling him that the elevator's out, but then when he looks back again, it's a different person. So... There is a lot of disorientation and a lot of confusing things in there. Um, I have always kind of made the joke that Terry Gilliam movies, I never understand the first time I see them. Like I, I almost have to watch one of his movies twice before it starts to sink in and make any sense. Um, and this is this is one that really plays with that because of, of all those things. So it was just one of those that, uh, that I thought was interesting to have uh, the character, the voice talking to him it seems to know a whole lot of stuff but yet who is he and why is he part is he dealing with the scientists how does he know any of this why is he just a voice uh, it's it's very strange there's a lot of really strange in this uh dr peters in this movie first he has almost no screen time like he's barely in it i'm sure i have a feeling he's more important in the series uh I don't even think he's in the series. No. I don't think his character was was brought forward. I'll have to take a look. But yeah, he had that one scene where she was at the book signing, and it was the kind of the weirdest freaking book signing, right? It really was. Where, where you've you've got all these people just flocking to her and, and trying to say, "Oh, I you should come to my research," or "This is awesome" and everything, and. Okay, you get fans, but you have them line. If you have a book signing, you have them line up the table. Yeah. You don't flock the table, right? Yeah, there's there's and some kind of to order table. to things, right? You have a line, and someone comes up, gets their book signed, and they move on. And this was just like everybody flooded the table, and we're just throwing books at her. Sign my book, and it's like okay. Meanwhile, here's Doctor Peters trying to talk to her at the same time, 
and he's so creepy. Oh my God, he's creepy. And every single thing that he does is creepy. When they're talking in the hospital, for lack of a better term, institution, wherever they're working out of, he's creepy there. He's mm -hmm. creepy at the book signing. He's uber creepy at the airport. Of course, now he's at peace with himself because he's right. now going to destroy the entire human race. And so yeah, he's creepy. It's that it's that uh, that like calm, almost whispery voice that David Morse uses. Um, and mm -hmm. like I like David Morse as an actor. Um, he's I think he's really good in a lot of different stuff. This is one of those roles that feels so weird to me because of that. Because he's like he's he's almost giddy about what he's doing all the time, but he's never showing that giddiness. It's just like. His voice is on the verge of doing that, uh, that kind of like excitedness all of the time. So it's just this breathy. Yeah. And it just it makes my skin crawl every time I watch this movie and he starts talking because I'm just like, oh, come on, dude, stop. Dial it back a little bit. You're, you're too good at the creepy. I think the I long do not disagree. I think the long red hair helped, too, because it just. Oh, yeah. With a ponytail. Yeah. The long ponytail down his back. And it just it doesn't look right on him. You know, you see this guy and he's big, tall guy and like i've always seen him with short hair but he's got this long and just just ginger red hair and just it, it's kind of like what they did with brad pitt in the movie where brad pitt is a good looking guy and in this movie he's made to he's made to be very odd looking and sort of the same thing with david morse like dr peters is just odd nothing ever seems right he gets too close to people when he's talking like when he's talking to uh um uh dr goyans in the laboratory it's like he has to get too close to him to talk to him because he's he's always got that real breathy voice thing going i was just yeah it was one of those um uh there was also i i i love when i see like again frank gorshin or some of these actors that were either went on to have bigger careers or had careers before and you see him in these small parts like chris maloney as the police detective who's got two scenes in the whole movie and of course he went on to be uh, Detective Stabler in uh, Law and Order SVU. I think he was on that show for what, ten years or something. Um, oh, twenty years or whatever. I don't know how long that one uh, ran, but yeah, I instantly recognized him from that show. He's got a lot more hair in the in this movie than I'm used to seeing him with. <laughs> um, but uh, and also talk about getting typecast. Like he was a cop even back then. He just always played cops of some kind. It seems. Um, some, but yeah, some people can't break out of whatever they're typecast. And if you're a working actor at some point, you got to make a decision of, I need money. Yeah. So, um, and then I don't know who she is at all, but the cabbie at the end. Yeah. What was her name? She I was meant to look that up. She might be one of my favorite taxi drivers in a movie. There's something about her. Like she's that kind of. Straight from central casting New York cabbie, even though it's in Philadelphia. Um, there was just something about her, like her performance and her demeanor as the cab driver. And I loved it. Maybe it's because she was really good at the um, the kind of taxi driver banter that you have to do when you're when you're driving. Uh, and I've done that in the past, but she was great. Um, her name is Annie Golden. Okay. And she's not really noted for anything. She was in Orange is the New Black, but I didn't never watch that, so I don't know mm. if she was in there. She was in there for 46 episodes. Oh, so, so she was... Apparently, she was around for a while. <laughs> I don't know. There's something just so great about that particular character in that moment. I think maybe because that's one of the happier moments in the movie, too. Like, this is a dour movie. This is a very, like, downer of a film for most of it. So... To have that moment, uh, maybe I remember that just more fondly because at that point, Dr. Rayleigh's feeling better. Uh, she's kind of come back around to being like, oh, no, okay, they're, they're just letting animals out. Like that's the reveal that the, 12, the Army of the Twelve Monkeys is just a, a dumb college activist group. But I loved, I loved the cab driver. Um, right. So there's a couple of things at the end. We mentioned the time travel stuff before. So, yeah, this is the good feeling stuff. But once mm -hmm. they get to the airport and everything happens, there's two things. You pointed out the Dr. Jones thing where she's on the plane with Dr. Peters. Yep. She's been exposed to the virus. So there's that going on. Then also 
Dr. Rayleigh is arrested at the end. Up till this point, I could be mistaken, but they didn't really, the cops didn't have cause to arrest her. There might have been some uncertainty for the whole brothel for the lack of a better term scene where they beat up the pimp. Oh there. yeah. The, the no tell motel. <laughs> yeah. But aside from that, she is considered to be the kidnappee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why is she being arrested? I, it's, it's really difficult to say with the end of the movie, kind of what's going on. I, it almost feels like they were arresting her based on the sort of disturbance that they were causing in the airport. And then, but you're right. She's she's been a uh, a victim and a and a kidnappee throughout most of the movie. So why why they arrest her? I I honestly don't know. Um, I I often forget about that. To be honest, like I just forget that. Oh, that's right. She's getting taken away at the end of the movie. Um, maybe it's because the the FBI agents are kind of following them at one point and see them together. And so maybe they're making an assumption that that she's now kind of flipped and is in on whatever plot they think that James Cole has going on. It's it, I'm not sure because that is odd. Um, here's a question for you: What did you think of the music in the movie? It wasn't strong. It it can it contributed to the obscurity of the grounding to me I, I it wasn't remarkable to me but at the same time it it didn't help give me certainty okay it was maybe uh, that's what i'm missing throughout this whole thing there is it definitely sounds as though expanding the story in the series and having taking that mental illness part of things out of it makes for a much more cohesive and kind of story that's easier to follow and because things make more sense, you don't have a main character who, for all intents and purposes, we're meant to believe everything that's happening to James Cole. But throughout the movie, he starts to vacillate and starts to wonder if he's really, I mean, there's the moment where he's in the bed and he says, you know, I'm insane and you're my insanity, talking to the doctors, which was another line that I really liked from the movie. This was written by David Peoples, by the way, who wrote Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. a few other pretty good movies, and, and his wife too, right? Yep, yeah, it was it was him and his wife that wrote it. Um, and there's some, I mean, there's some good lines in there. Um, that being one of them, I thought. Um, but it's just such a weird, trippy movie, and the the fact that you have, you know, your main character spends the first half hour of the movie drugged up through most of it, um, just just chock full of sedatives, so he's as you said, drooling the whole time and it is off putting. And then from there he starts to, he starts to unravel. You've got Dr. Rayleigh who meets him, has some sort of an affinity for him, feels bad for him in a way. And then six years go by and the guy just shows back up and then she's kind of, she's afraid for him. He kidnaps her, but then she starts to come around to kind of what he's saying based on, you know, things like him talking about the kid in the well um, and it being uh, a fake thing and, and kind of all of that. And she starts to listen to him. So now they're uh, reversed. He's, he's trying to convince himself that he's insane. And she is starting to believe all the stories that he's been telling her that, that up until that point she believed were con constructs of his own mind. And so it, it does, like, it moves back and forth and it can be very odd and confusing to try and follow like well wait who thinks what at this point and then to have everything you know continue on until the end and things happen like her getting arrested and you don't know why like why are the police doing whatever they're doing at all why did they just shoot him uh on site without because it's almost like she knew that that would happen if the cops showed up because she says at some point uh they'll shoot you or they'll they'll look at me as an accessory or something like that yeah, they'll have, I can't remember what was said, but it was before they went through security and before she got the tickets. 
one difference between the series and the film is the film was in the mid 90s and the mid 90s i won't say there weren't a lot of strong female characters but there's nowhere near oh. as many strong female characters as there are today and the series really explores strong female characters for one thing the brad pitt character is a strong female character the actress that plays the goins character i can't remember her name off the top of my head but she is just fantastic. And then you've got several of the other characters in there as well. There's like a black hat character that is just amazing. Dr. Jones is fully flushed out and she is amazing. And there's just this breadth of characters, both in present day and in the future in the 2040s that are amazing. I'm not gonna say that the Dr. Rayleigh in the film was not a strong character i had some difficulties probably because of the unreliable narrative that was going on where she was a little bit hysterical at some points mm -hmm. where i was like eh, that's not necessarily what i'm used to but then again i did live through the 90s so i understand <laughs> why movies went that way in the 90s and dr Rayleigh was portrayed like that so that is a difference between the two is you get many more strong female characters and many more balanced female characters in the future. And, and that makes for a better series in of itself. And as uh, Emily Hampshire plays Jennifer Goins in the, the series. And I like yeah, she's amazing. I like switching that up and, and having that Goins character being uh, a woman in the series. Um, I think that's a, uh, just based on my knowledge of the movie, I think that's an interesting um, way to kind of update the story uh, a little bit. So, and you're right, the '90s definitely it was a very different time writing uh, characters at all, and certainly female characters were not written nearly as strong or didn't typically like. One of the things with Dr. Rayleigh in this is it doesn't feel like she has a lot of her own kind of agency. Uh, she's She's being swept along in whatever's going on, but she doesn't really have a say in what's happening. Whether it's the the other doctors, um, not really like they sort of believe in her, but kind of not. They're a little bit dismissive. Like there's that whole scene where Frank Gorshin's doctor is like, you know, you're being very defensive, and she's trying to explain that she's not, but he's just not listening to her. Um, so there's a lot of that 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 goes on too, and. Uh, yeah, I can I can one hundred percent see that. So it's great that they fleshed out more characters um, and have them. Uh, I think be more. In, it makes more in, for more interesting stories too, instead of just being the same types of characters all the time. So I did like. There's that. more. I just didn't want to spoil oh. anything, so I was just going off of kind of what we knew sure. already. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Because um, yeah, it it you you've you've convinced me to watch it finally. Like. I'm going to, um, and I'm really curious to see how it, how the series from me works based on my, cause I really, really enjoy this movie. Um, so I'm, I'm just interested in that part of it. Uh, I did mention the music and one of the things I wanted to mention, and I did not know this until today is the guy that, um, composed the music for this Paul Buckmaster. He wasn't really a film score. Uh, type person. He's not your John Williams, Howard Shore, where he's got a long history of film scores. He's more just kind of the record industry. Um, but he did do the music, or at least the opening theme for uh, a 90s era cartoon called Peter Pan and the Pirates. And it's one of the most epic opening cartoon themes you'll ever hear. Like, it's so much better than the show has any right to have for opening music. Uh, and I had no idea that he had done that. And I, I remember the song uh, from the opening of Peter Pan and the Pirates, and then uh, I read that earlier tonight. I'm like, Paul Buckmaster did both of those. That's crazy. Because the music in this is it's based on, I guess, Argentinian tango is where that kind of accordion opening theme thing comes from that plays throughout the movie. And it is something that I always remember. I don't necessarily remember the melody. I just remember kind of the the sound style um, of that. And it it feels very Terry Gilliam. That's another thing he does is he picks these kind of musical motifs and plays them through um, 
there's uh what's the song that the doctors the scientists are singing when he comes back to the the future it's like blue valentine or something oh yeah i forgot i that went in and out of my ears when it was on screen it's whatever one that they also played in the car he did a terry gilliam did a similar thing in the movie brazil is a song called brazil that plays throughout the whole thing uh they come back to it all the time so he he likes to do stuff with that too and it's always very odd music it's not like what you would traditionally think of in a movie or kind of pop music um it's this sort of just i don't want to say avant-garde but like out there a little different a little left to center so you said that buckman right is that his name buckman? uh buckmaster uh, buckmaster you said he did one of the most arc- iconic cartoon themes is it as iconic as the 92 x-men the animated series theme or are we talking just completely different genre a different style um but it's like that where that opening theme is just so good and the 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 90s x-men cartoon was good and i very much enjoyed it but that opening theme is like way better than you know it goes so much harder than it needs to for the opening to a cartoon it's like that that opening now instead of being um, kind of synthesized and rock based. It's very sort of traditional orchestral um, for Peter Pan and the Pirates, but it's it's that level of like, wow, this is way more than they needed to do for this show. Yeah, same era, 90 to 91, 65 episodes, and X Men the Animated Series ran for five years starting in 92. Okay. Which, which is coming back. Um, yes, Disney's... I know. I, so I do a podcast on the Marvel Cinematic Universe oh, called right. Legends of Shield, and we are rewatching. And for me, it's the first time. Uh, the early '90s, I didn't get to watch too many movies and TVs just because of where I was in life. I won't go into it, but I'd never seen it. So we're rewatching. I'm watching for the first time the '92 X-Men the animated series. We actually interviewed Eric and Julia Lawald. And Eric Lewald was basically the showrunner. They okay. didn't really have showrunners back then, but he was basically the showrunner for it. And his wife was one of the writers on the show. So we interviewed them a couple of weeks back. And we've gone into the history and stuff like that. Now, yeah, I bring cool. up Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. not necessarily for the music, but it's cool to talk about the music between the two composers. What I'm really bringing it up for, though, is we podcasted about Legion and talk about a mental health on reliable narrator series mm-hmm. legion was really difficult to watch and podcast on it was an fx series before marvel consolidated everything into yep. disney plus and it was more adult than you typically would see on tv and if i had to choose between this 12 monkeys series and Le- or film mm-hmm. and the legion series of how they dealt with the mental illness, mental instability, unreliable narrator, I'll say they did it right over in Legion versus what they did here. And I did have difficulty going through Legion as well. Mm -hmm. It's not my favorite Marvel series, but because we wanted to go through it, we did. And the character of Legion is a huge mentally unstable person in the Mm -hmm. Marvel Cinematic Universe. So it does deal with those issues and that was a series so it's pre-disney marvel but it's probably what like 20 like late 20 teens right 2017 or something i think i don't remember the exact year but 2017 would be a good guess for me right and that's you said that was a fedex series i or fedex wow (laughs) i was gonna say i didn't know fedex owned fedex 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 is now uh (laughs) producing shows i it's work related it's too much too many shipping things um fx series so i wonder too like we have so portraying mental instability on screen and in you know in fiction has gotten much better over the years as we've understood more and kind of understood how to do it and it's not a uh, a punchline anymore um and so I have a feeling that, that that has to play a lot into it, right? Like just the sensibilities and, and the understanding of kind of how some of that can work or not work um, over time would make that. that. It's interesting, though, that you bring that up and that I, I would agree. I think that they do portray it better there um, I, because I think here 
it does feel as though may it, it's I think because in Twelve Monkeys it's taken to an extreme for a like a an absurd uh, level um, with just how you know all the scenes those early scenes in the asylum which were filmed at Eastern State Penitentiary, um, they uh, which is a, a very famous um, prison in Pennsylvania that now is uh, like haunted attraction. Um, that that's where they filmed it. It's, it's been abandoned for for a long time, but they. So uh, it's not like welcome to the rock. Yeah, no, not quite. Um, you just had to get that in there. It's good with the with the gray beard. It works perfectly too. Thank you. Um, but it's uh, it, like it's almost to a cartoonish level that absurdity of how out there everyone is, and like Jeffrey, for instance, yelling at somebody for sitting in his chair and like freaking out, and it's that mania, that manic energy that he brings. Um, there's something again that just it's like cranked up to eleven, and and made to be more outlandish, um, which for this movie for me worked, uh, but I can understand it not uh, in in a lot of other ways too. So, I mean, look, I'm honestly I'm glad that you got to see this movie, um, even if you probably didn't love the time, the, the two hours you spent watching it. But at the same time, for me, it's, it's interesting because I get to hear about it from a different perspective, coming at it from somebody who hasn't seen it before and has a background with the story that's being told, but from a different, um, a different point of view in terms of just having seen that series first. And so I like hearing the kind of the, the things that are different and didn't work for you that for me are like, parts of why I love this particular movie. So it's very interesting in that way. And so I'm glad that you, uh, you know, you put up with the movie enough to come and then talk with me about it. Cause, uh, you know, it's fun that it was free. I watched it on Tubi this is actually the first movie I ever watched on Tubi, but I wasn't going to pay for it yet. Cause I've heard things about it from people that watch the series. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I want to own it or not. So sure. I'll that's rent fair. it. So I watched it on Tubi. Commercials weren't too bad, by the way, on Tubi on this. There were some, but it wasn't bad. I had the opportunity to possibly watch another movie on Tubi that I declined called Slipstream, the 1989 mm. Slipstream movie with Mark Hamill. And I actually purchased that, which actually worked a little bit better in that case because there was visuals that you could see better on the remastered version versus the non remastered version on Tubi. So anyway, for those that might want to go watch this, it's free on Tubi. You can go ahead and watch. You can get away with, I can't remember how many there were, like three or four, not any more than five commercial breaks in and there. Yeah. So, Tubi is a surprisingly good service um, in that they've got a really extensive library of stuff and their commercial breaks. Yeah, there's commercials. And I know some people that would just, immediately refuse to watch anything because of that, but they're not super intrusive and they're pretty, they're short. They're like 90 seconds usually uh, for, for a break. And I don't think that it was remastered in any way, like on TV, right? Mm -hmm. We've shortened it for runtime or we've clipped stuff out because we couldn't show it due to ratings or whatever. I don't yeah. think they're doing that on Tubi. No, they're definitely showing the full like theatrical release of a movie. Um, they're just uh, just tossing commercials in there every so often so they can keep the service up and running. When they have the TV series that run on Tubi, um, they put the commercials right, usually right around the commercial breaks. Uh, it's not perfect because it's all algorithm driven, but it's a surprisingly good seri uh, uh, service. Um, I actually watch quite a bit on there uh, for this show and for, uh, for other shows that I do because sometimes it's the only place you can find something. And I'm like you, I don't necessarily want to buy the movie that I'm going to watch because I may never do that again. But if it's something where, you know, I'm a little bit on the fence, Hey, it's a great, uh, it's a great option to have. Um, and this way you, uh, I, I, this way I don't get hounded to give you a refund for your two hours. Uh, <laughs> I don't owe you five <laughs> bucks hours, for this minute. Oh, yeah, that's right. Two hours, go. six minutes. Um, but I also think that sometimes it's kind of, it's good to sort of step outside and watch something that maybe, uh, doesn't completely connect with you, and then you might go back now and watch the series again, or 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 the next movie that you watch, you might to pull a line from this, see in a different way. 
because of, I'd sort always of that planned, experience. I'd always planned on going back and actually watching this, so it's, it's no big deal that I watched it. I'm glad that I saw the series first because the series fits with me better mm -hmm. and sounds like you might have the opposite opinion because of what drew you to 12 monkeys in the film is different than what's portrayed in the series. So I'd be interested to get some feedback on, you know, whenever you finish watching the four seasons on whether you liked it or not. So who knows in a couple of months, we might be having another conversation. Sure. I will absolutely give feedback on that because I love storytelling and I, that's why I love movies and television so much because it's just such a, a for me, a great medium to tell good stories in. And I like different ways of telling stories. So I'm really curious to see, okay, now that I know what I know about this movie, how did these people then take that and adapt it and make it into something different and, and do that? That's why I loved, um, you know, I mean, one of my favorite adaptations of all time because I loved the books was Lord of the Rings and seeing how they changed it from, from page to screen was cool because it's the same story, but they definitely change things things that just don't work in a movie that work in a book. Um, I had a conversation with uh, somebody recently, earlier this year, about um, actually a movie that came out in 95, Congo, um, and how adapting Michael Crichton is so very hit and miss. It can go really well, like Jurassic Park, even though that, again, changed a lot, or it can go not so great, like Congo, which has some cool ideas but the execution of it wasn't great. And that's a, such a weird, his, his books are odd to, to do anyway, but like, I just love changes in stories and adaptations. And so I'm really curious to see how different this is from this movie because, and, and I also think that it's smart that they did that. I think it's, it's very smart of them to, uh, Oh, we're going to make 12 monkeys. Cause I heard about the series and I'm like, how would you make that movie into a series? It didn't make any sense to me because of how weird this movie is. Like, I couldn't see this Terry Gilliam thing with Bruce Willis drooling uh, for half of it being made into a series. But to hear that they just, they kind of took the the core concepts of it and then went in a very different direction with it has my interest because I do think those core concepts are very cool. And so I want to see, let's get it away from the lens of this particular person and let's dive into that story. So I'm, you, you've convinced me enough that I'm, I'm definitely going to watch it, and I will give you feedback. I will let you know what I think of it. Cool. Another series movie pairing that was a little bit more connected but I thought was different was Stargate and Stargate SG-1, mm -hmm. Atlantis and Universe, right? Very different, same universe, very different. And then once Amazon bought out MGM, they're thinking about rebooting it. Actually, they were thinking about rebooting it forever. But the original creators of the movie were like, yeah, we, we're just going to shove the TV series aside and we're going to go ahead with a Stargate 2 movie and pretend those series never existed. Of course, the fan base was like, no, you don't, because yeah. there's more fan base from the series than not. So MGM could never really get that off the ground. Now that Amazon owns MGM, I have no idea what they're going to do. If they're going to do a complete reboot, if they're going to do a revival, if they're going to do a continuation, I don't know what they're going to do. But Amazon is not stupid. They realize that there is a fandom and they're going to at least put something on the screen that is Stargate related. We'll see what that happens in the future. But as far as the movie and the series, there were people that liked the campiness of Stargate SG-1 and didn't really like the movie. But then this IP got to the point where there was another series called Stargate Universe, which was yep. darker and grittier. So mm -hmm. the people that liked the Stargate IP because of Stargate SG-1 and Stargate Atlantis, which, by the way, Jason Momoa is in that, if you're yeah, a Jason is. Momoa fan. And Universe, though... Same character, same universe, but much, much darker. So that was a series that was, or an IP that has been all over the place, and I'm interested in where that goes in the future. I don't see 12 Monkeys being rebooted, revived, or continued anytime soon, simply because of the whole pandemic. I, I don't think anybody yeah. wants to wade into that subject matter anytime soon. Well, it's no longer uh, an out-there idea and science fiction. It's something that people have been living through. And so it's a lot harder to to 
kind of get yourself into the mindset to want to watch something like that um, because it does definitely feel like it's too real. Um, and I, I love that you brought up Stargate because that's a great, uh, that's a great one. I love like, usually you get a series and then they'll make a movie out of it, whether that's good or not. It's hard to say, but I like the reverse where you take a movie and you expand it into a series and, and Stargate's perfect for that because I remember seeing the movie and I like the movie the movie's great. Nothing wrong with it. It's one of the better Roland Emmerich films that I've seen because it's not just about the apocalypse. Um, it's not his end of the world disaster porn movies like uh, was it uh, end of um, uh, the day after tomorrow and uh, 2012 and uh, this is the latest one Moon Moonfall is it I don't remember whatever I one have where they've not the, seen Moonfall yet where that the moon's crashing into the earth. Yeah. Um, but like I love Stargate and then when the series came out you're right they went in a different direction with it and it worked. And it was great. And I remember Stargate Atlantis premiering um, and uh, watching that and seeing Jason Momoa, uh, young Jason Momoa at that. Um, I didn't watch Universe. That's the only one I didn't because it just happened to hit at a time when I didn't have enough time to watch it. And from what I hear, that one started off a little slow but got better uh, kind of as it went. I don't I'm, – I'm curious they, to see that one at some point. Yeah, they totally shifted it towards the end because it got a lot of bad – reviews bad critics mm. uh, on the whole thing i mean they were going into the darker grittier thing side of things you got to remember when Battlestar galactica was out which was darker and grittier yeah stargate was already out stargate started on showtime mm -hmm. and then migrated to sci-fi channel skiffy sci-fi whatever you want to call it <laughs> i think there were at like Season seven out of 10 with Stargate SG-1 when Battlestar Galactica actually made it into series. There was the whole mini series in 2003, 2004. And then yeah. they said, okay, we're going to go ahead with a series. And I think there were about season seven or eight out of the 10 by the time that BSG was going. So they had already had the campy going for quite some time and they continued right. it with Atlantis, but I think they wanted to recreate and rekindle the fandom by saying, oh, we can go dark and gritty too. So they did that with Universe, and then the Stargate fandom said, this is not what we signed up for. Yeah. So they, they changed it back, but by that time, it was kind of a Enterprise issue with the Star Wars, or mm -hmm. Star... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Star <laughs> Trek. I didn't mean that. Star Trek fandom when you finally got to the Enterprise series with Scott Bakula where everybody was like, okay, this is no, this is just too much. Let's just end this thing. And they did after four seasons. I believe everything else did seven seasons. Yep. And Enterprise got shoved down to four seasons. I think maybe five, but four seasons or something like that. And that's where Universe fell, where it was a tired fandom of okay you've taken this in a direction that we don't want it to go in and they started losing audience it's hard and like how how long do you run a story either a series or spin-offs of a series before you just sort of you run into that problem right i mean Ask two people that question, and you get two different answers. That's Kathleen true. Kennedy and Kevin Feige. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong there. I think it, part of it is how you adapt and evolve your stories over time. Because you can look at, like, I used to watch, uh, for instance, uh, an example is NCIS. I enjoyed that show for what it was. It was a procedural. I knew what I was getting, but I enjoyed that. But at a certain point, usually around like the 15th season, I'm like, okay, I just, I'm, I can't keep watching the same thing. You've got to do something new. Plus you've got three or four spinoffs of it. CSI did the same. Um, and like Star Trek, Star Trek never had a lot of concurrently running shows. They would always sort of overlap by a year or two because it was what, uh, TNG was like 87 to 95, I want to say. For seven years, yeah. And then you had a couple of years of overlap with DS9, which had a couple of years of overlap with Voyager. Um, but they weren't connected just because of where they were. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's another part of it too. And then when you do a tonal shift, it can be difficult because 
half your fandom is like, cool, this is new. This is something exciting. Um, maybe less than half. And, and the others are like, this is different and I fear change and I don't want this. And you, it's balancing that. Uh, Battlestar Galactica with Starbuck. There's your example right there. Yeah. Yep. Plus that, that uh, early 2000s BSG series really changed a lot of things and made other series try to then re like copy it, I think would be a way to put it, but like get the same idea. So you saw all of a sudden a shift from, because pre Battlestar Galactica, you had SG-1, Farscape was another show that was real big uh, in the early 2000s, late 90s, and that was very Andromeda. campy. Andromeda. Andromeda. Avalon 5. Yeah, which I'm curious to see that uh, that new series. Right? Is it a new series or are they doing a movie? I forget. I, I, and this is another thing. I think it's going to be a continuation. Oh. I don't think it's going to be a reboot or a revival. I think it's going to be a continuation. I oh, could be wrong on that, but that's how I remember it. So we'll see there. As far as BSG, it's interesting to note that the showrunner for that, Ronald D. Moore, came out of Star Trek, mm -hmm. Star Trek Voyager. He tried to take that into a darker, gritty, and DS9 uh, tried to take that into a darker, grittier place. And the powers that be said, at Paramount said no. So mm -hmm. he's like, fine, I'll go do my own thing. And he got uh, critical success. Now, he hasn't really gotten that much success since For All Mankind on... Apple TV Plus right now is about the closest you're going to get, but it hasn't gotten the same sort of wide sweeping notoriety that BSG did within the community. It's like, okay, it's another service that I have to go buy. If you have the subscription to Apple TV Plus, For All Mankind is a really cool thing. It's an alternative history is what it is with okay. space travel in case you don't know what it is. And yes, it is good, but you have to be in the mood for it sort of thing. Okay. It's always interesting to see when a show comes along that that does something different than what you have and then to see sort of the fallout of that, BSG being that one where your sci-fi previous to that, especially like major series, were kind of one way and then seeing things. Uh, you know, superhero movies are another one um, with kind of Marvel-style movies versus DC going in a different direction with a lot of theirs, whether it works for you or not. Um, and then seeing sort of the crossing of all of that as media always tries to play catch up. Somebody will make one thing that's different. It You, know, you get that lightning in a bottle. I had this discussion about um, Thor Love and Thunder versus Thor Ragnarok and how people were complaining about a lot of stuff in Love and Thunder that Ragnarok did essentially the same thing and... I was sort of like, well, yeah, but Ragnarok, when it did it, it was new and it hadn't really, we hadn't seen that yet. And now we're seeing it, but it's just, we're seeing it again. There's one big difference between those two movies and it's those dang screaming goats. <laughs> those, the, okay, so the goats in that movie are a love it or hate it. You either love that joke or you absolutely hate that. And every time they're on screen, you just want to gouge your eyes out. I, I get it. Might like it for the first time, maybe the <laughs> second time. But by the third time, everybody's like, okay, th this is way too much. We need to move on from the screaming goats. <laughs> oh, that's fair. That is fair. Well, SP, thank you for being on this week. This was this was a fun conversation. We went in a few different directions. Uh, didn't solely talk about the movie, but that's fun. I love that. I just like seeing where things go. Um, but I am glad that you did sit down and watch it, um, and uh, I love getting your perspective on it. And, um, you know, I look, I love this movie. You didn't. It's fine. We can have the, the different opinion on that, and that's the beauty of art, in my opinion, is that two people can watch the same piece of art and take two very different things away from it. Um, and and just having a discussion about it is great. It's what I... That's why I do what I do. Um, you, you had you mentioned a show that you do called uh, was it Legends of Shield? Sorry, Legends of Shield. Okay. It was a podcast started to cover the original Agents of Shield television show yep. way back when in 2012, and it has morphed into a Marvel Studios covering podcast. Anything in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, really, we cover. And then some stuff that's outside of it, we cover as well. We just did a great one shot on Werewolf by Night. Oh, that was which, fun. That was 
that was a surprising one. I had no idea it was even being made. It showed up on Disney Plus, and one of my co-hosts was like, can't we cover it? I'm like, sure, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we've been going on. We, we just recorded episode 450. We've been going on for over 10 years now. So it's been a real fun podcast. That's yeah, awesome. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And it's a lot of, I mean, Marvel stuff, a lot of content there to mine. There is so much. You know, we thought about ramping down the podcast after Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and after Endgame. And we're like, oh, well, there's more stuff. So we'll we'll go with it for now. There was an uncertainty because the Netflix shows were going away at mm-hmm. the time. Remember, they yep. all got canceled kind of sequentially. And Disney Plus wasn't a thing yet. And we're like, okay, yeah. is this going to work? Is it not going to work? Have all the Disney Plus shows hit? No. But there's been some really good ones for Marvel. So, yeah, we've been enjoying it for now. And then when we're not enjoying it anymore, we'll probably close it down. I had a similar podcast over on the DC side of things. Okay. And it was covering the Arrow show. It's yeah. called Starling Tribune. When Arrow ended, we mercifully ended that podcast because <laughs> we're like, no, we can't. We can't cover this stuff anymore. So hopefully James Gunn over on the DC side of things can bring back the storytelling because there are some tidbits of good in there with Shazam and stuff. Oh, sure. But for the most part, I'm more of a Marvel guy right now than I am a DC guy. So, yeah, we cover Marvel stuff over on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's really cool. And I, I'm with you in that not all of the Marvel shows hit 100% of the time, but I do think that more times than not, it's not boring there's something in there to to at least discuss and talk about whether it works for you or not is a different story but i do think so that's that's cool that you have uh you know kind of the we're we're lousy with choice right now in terms of the content you mentioned something before about me not liking the 12 monkeys and you enjoying 12 monkeys Mm -hmm. i discovered a long time ago i'm not going to quash anybody's fandom i'm not going to quash anybody's enjoyment of anything and I learned that with the original Suicide Squad, not the second one that James Gunn did, but the first Suicide Squad sure. movie that went out. I went ballistic on that. That was something that I was like, I can't believe this was even allowed to be out there. <laughs> and I learned that some people actually enjoyed it. And I was like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? And then over the course of like months, I was like, oh. I am doing to you what I hate being done to me. And that is I am taking away your enjoyment of your entertainment. And that's all it is. It's entertainment. This isn't life, people. This is exactly I'm going to watch this for fun. This we do these podcasts for fun. Mm -hmm. This is just how do I like this? And let's talk about it sort of thing. Maybe learn something about life Mm -hmm. to mention like how these things are made or something like that. So I enjoy talking to people that have differing opinions because they bring to light different things about the art that we're watching, and I'm fine with that. Now, am I going to change my opinion on the original Suicide Squad movie? No, I am never going to watch that again. Am I ever going to change my opinion on this, 12 Monkeys? I don't know, maybe if I ever get on a mental health, mental illness (laughs) kick again. I, I might, honestly, just to go back and see how this was treated versus how something else is treated. Sure. But I'm not planning on it. So, you know, this is great. I'm glad I got to experience it. So thank you. Absolutely. And and I'm with you 100%. I don't have to agree with somebody to have a conversation with them about a movie or a television show. There's stuff that I have watched that I just can't get behind. Uh, Suicide Squad actually being one of those. Um, there's like, that's a movie where there were a couple of moments where I'm like, okay, mate, but then it just like, what, what's going on? Um, that's bad. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, I felt the same. I felt similar about say like moments in the prequels for star Wars. And yet I will talk to people who that's what they grew up on. And those are their star Wars movies. And I'm not going to take that away from them because at the end of the day, you're right. It's entertainment. It's meant to make us feel good about something. If you enjoy Velocipaster, that's cool. Uh, maybe I didn't love it, although I kind of like that, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> I like that for, for reasons that make no sense whatsoever. Um, uh, it, it fascinates me when somebody makes a movie for $50 in a case of beer. And that's basically what that movie was. Like it's literally a cardboard dinosaur at the end of it. It's I didn't know you watched slipstream. <laughs> oh man. I haven't seen that in so long. Now you're making me want to watch it though. 
Um, yeah, well, it's first. First of all, uh, I consider it to be a bad movie, so you have been forewarned. However, <laughs> it does have some phenomenal actors in that. Bill Paxton, Mark Hamill, a lot of good actors are in that. Uh, Hagrid himself is in there. Robbie Coltrane oh, nice. is in there too. So yeah, it's got a lot of good actors in it. Uh, unfortunately, Kirk's who was George Lucas's right hand for mm -hmm. a few films, including Star Wars. He was going through a terrible divorce and lost all his money, so he couldn't Ooh. fund the film. So CGI fell through, and then he couldn't film the action scenes ne necessary to bring to the editing room to make a good movie. So it turned out to be a terrible movie. So, yeah, just have fun when you watch it, because <laughs> you're going to have to. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on. This is this has been great. You're welcome back anytime. If you think of another movie you haven't seen, or maybe you got something uh, that you just absolutely love and you wanna you wanna bring it to me, um, I'm all for that too. Uh, so this has been great. I think we discussed a list, so yeah, we'll we'll have to go to number two on the list. All right, sounds great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this show I do record live um, Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash TV's Travis. You can hang out in the chat room. Uh, and and chat with us during a movie. Tom uh, or Norm, sorry, Norm was in the chat tonight. Uh, it's also the show does have a Patreon, Patreon.com/slash wyhs. You can support the show there if you'd like to for as little as a dollar an episode. And um, next week, Norm in the chat actually is coming on. We're going to talk about Gladiator. He's never seen it before, and I can't wait because there's another movie that there's like Twelve Monkeys. There's a lot in Gladiator to kind of chew on and talk about. And I'm curious to see what he thinks of that movie after going for however long and never seeing it. Because sometimes there's movies where you're just like, how did you not even accidentally see that? Last week, I had Brian Ibbett on. And he had never seen the original 1978 Halloween. And I was like, how, how did you not like just find that on cable one, one afternoon somewhere? Like, by accident and see that. And he goes, I just never did. So... It's amazing. It's amazing how that can happen sometimes. That's why I started this show. I just love having these conversations. So, SP, thank you so much for being here. This has been great. And Thank uh, you very much for having me. Absolutely. And until next week, uh, as I like to say every week, get out and enjoy your movies or stay in and enjoy your movies. That's fine, too. But let's be excellent to each other. Excellent. Well, thank you. It was fun. Thank you. It was. I, I, I will say I really do enjoy having conversations when, when I don't agree with the person on like the thing that we're talking about. So when you came on at the start and we're saying, uh, even uh, earlier today when you're like, I watched that stupid movie yesterday. I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be fun. I can't wait. So that's super great. Um, man, is Legion streaming anywhere? I don't know. I haven't looked. Well, you know, just watch. Let's find out. Yeah. I, I also yesterday podcasted on Morbius, so this has been a fun <laughs> month, month and a half. Yeah, that's another one where. Hmm. And we actually podcasted with uh, somebody that went to school basically to be a transmedia storytelling expert. And so, something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the Sony Spider-Man Universe, whatever, that's transmedia, where, where you creating a universe and yep. stuff like that. And uh, she came on basically as a, okay, as a script doctor, mm -hmm. this is what I would fix with it, or this is what I ha have problems with it. <laughs> so that was uh, an interesting conversation. Uh, probably the only way that I would have liked to have watched the movie is to have that conversation afterwards. And like, I'm not a big Jared Leto fan. Uh, I think he can be difficult. Uh, he just, I just never really connected with him on stuff. I didn't think he was awful, but that whole movie, there's just like, I could 
tell when I because I went and saw that in the theater, and my whole time watching it, I just kept thinking, I feel like they were trying to make a different movie, and then this is what they ended up with. One of the problems that we ran into with the movie is Jared Leto was out acted by uh, Smith. Oh, one hundred percent. But I mean, Hunter. And and it's tough to have a movie when your villain completely outacts you. Now, you could say something like Tom Holland and Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton definitely had the more gravitas from there. But Tom Hel- Holland held his own. Absolutely. Just as an example mm-hmm. in the superhero genre, right? Uh, this, Jared Leto did not, I mean, he's a good actor, mm-hmm. but he just didn't Something was missing. match up yeah. to Smith. Yeah. Well, and I mean, uh, I, like, I loved Matt Smith in the movie, but it also felt like, it almost felt like he was in the wrong movie at times, too. I think Matt Smith was the only one who understood the assignment. <laughs> he was the only one that went into the movie correctly, that everybody else was having trouble fitting themselves into, including Jared Harris, who tried. Oh, but... and that, that hurt me so much because Jared Harris is fantastic. Love him in Foundation. I love oh. him in everything. I love, yeah. But Foundation is, he's just amazing. Yeah. He's, he's just... also one of the guys that, uh, for, for, he's, he's a hard acting actor. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing a series, you have him for one, maybe two seasons, and that's it. He's going to move on to something else. And they yeah. had that problem in The Expanse, where they were very fortunate to get him. They, they appreciated him. They tried to write him in. But when it came down to, like season three, they're like, he's like, no, I, I, I can't be there because I'm busy with this new project. So I, he, I, the filming schedule doesn't work for me. It's like, uh, it's like if you cast Christopher Eccleston in something, you're going to get Eccleston. He's going to be phenomenal for the time that he's there, but he's going to move on and do something else and you're going to lose him. Um, just watch says Legion is also on Hulu. Awesome. Hulu's man. Hulu's got some good stuff too. Because Legion, that's uh, Charles Xavier's son, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And Aubrey Plaza is in it. Oh. She's one of the main characters. And she just got uh, announced as being in the Agatha Harkness series. That's right. It, it, does she go by she? At, at pro, the whole pronoun oh, thing with her. I'm, I'm not, not sure. sure. I'm not sure with Aubrey Plaza. I haven't heard one way or the other. Uh, but uh, has been... Um, cast i'm i'm curious on that uh i mean the marvel stuff what what feige's doing and like all the different series and stuff like you said some of it doesn't hit some of it does what what did you think of um for instance like she hulk was that one that we went into she hulk and we were just enjoying it we were enjoying the fourth wall breaking and everything uh, I think it went on for either too many episodes or not enough episodes and then the way they did the ending was completely wrong it was either too much fourth break, fourth wall breaking, not enough. It was uh, not paying attention to everything in the story. We had one of our co-hosts, so we have four permanent co-hosts, and we have guest people that come in as well. One of the permanent co-hosts enjoyed it, and we had an interesting discussion. We were very respectful of ever, everybody's opinion on mm-hmm. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., and she... We were bring, she was bringing up points, but the rest of us were just bringing it. Okay, maybe for you, but for me, this is how it felt, and I I can't go back. There's very little way to salvage that story from now on. Like I don't think a season two is going to be possible. I think you're going to have to inject the character into other things. Now, what I would have liked to have seen, for instance would have been a uh, post-credit scene with um, Ryan Reynolds and with, um, what's her name, um, uh, Masil- Masilani. Oh, Maslani, uh, yeah. Ta- Tatiana Maslani. I would have loved to have seen them sitting on a couch critiquing each other's fourth wall breaks. That would have that been, would have been a, a perfect <laughs> way to end the whole thing. Uh, also, I didn't think that they knew the gravitas that Madison was going to bring to the series. Nope. So it was already filmed and done by the time they got to the end. Uh, so they they should have brought her back, but they didn't. And uh, th- there's a whole bunch of things. But th- the big thing was 
the big MacGuffin that occurred throughout the entire series was just wished away with the whole K-E-V-I-N scene. Mm -hmm. And then you went back and it was like, okay, so did this happen or did this not happen? And that's the big thing. What actually, what was real? What happened in that series? And you don't know at yeah. the end. I kind of agree with you in that I think, I don't think it was too few or too many episodes. I think they needed like another episode or two to kind of... Oddly enough, they were originally greenlit for 10 episodes and the showrunner came in and said, we only need nine. Hmm. I mean, I... I would have liked one more episode because that finale, while there's a lot I liked about the finale, um, it did feel like they kind of tried to condense down what should have been a little bit more into it. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's I'm not the one making those decisions. So I just sit back and watch. And if I like it, I like it. And if I don't, I don't. Like WandaVision, I enjoyed the hell out of WandaVision. Um, I liked Falcon and Winter Soldier two which seems to me like the the one that sort of had the most tepid response from a lot of people that i've talked to where they're just like yeah it, it was did. there um i enjoyed it but i enjoyed it for what it was which was it was just sort of it wasn't doing anything new and i think coming off the heels of wandavision and how radically different that was in terms of of the way it was presented to then have Falcon and Winter Soldier, which was very straightforward, kind of more by the numbers presentation, made it feel like it was more sort of just there and not really giving us anything new um, in that way. So that's kind of... I have enjoyed the fact that they have been backdooring, and it's obvious it's not even backdooring anymore. They're creating... Young Avengers or mm -hmm. Champions, whichever yeah. way you want to go with it. I don't know what they're going to call it. And there's been secretive dates that they haven't labeled in the MCU timeline of, okay, so there's this unlabeled movie or untitled TV show or yep. this untitled project that is there. And it's obvious to me that one of the big ones is several uh, Young Avengers or Champions movies. It's going to be a series of events going forward and they've done a phenomenal job i was like wondering uh one of the things that they were missing was a hulkling and then out of she hulk you did get scar and a lot of people had issues with scar what scar where is he coming from uh he's bruce banner's kid how did that happen i'm like i really don't care i think we're gonna get the backstory on yeah, that we'll get I, that. Not, I don't care that we're missing it it's important though that he was introduced so that we can bring him forth into young avengers or champions yeah yeah that was that was a moment where i was like oh okay because all we saw was bruce leave and then he shows up at the end and he's got scar with him and then i, rem I remember like at least in the comics time on sakar worked differently and so there's a little bit of that at play too i think maybe they'll factor that in who knows it's hard to say i, know. I but at the end i'm with you i don't care he's there so they can backfill the reasons for that and uh let's just see what they do there's two remaining characters that they need to introduce or get in there somehow and i have every faith in kevin feige that he's going to do it one is Nova, the young Nova, and mm. we we already know that there's going to be a Nova series greenlit, so that's kind of obvious to me. And the other one is going to be a little bit more difficult, but if anybody can pull it off, I know Kevin Feige can, and that is Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, that'll be that'll be pretty cool. What did you think of um, before I let you go, uh, Harrison Ford as uh, stepping in for Thunderbolt Ross? I love the casting. My concern is his age. Mm -hmm. Like, how long do you want this character to go? Is it literally just to get through the Thunderbolts project, or do you want the character around a little bit more than that? That's the issue that I have, is I think you only have one shot with him. Yeah. And after that, you, you can't plan for anything. And I think Star Wars tried to do that, and they, unfortunately they did it in an order that they shouldn't have. They, they And... I don't blame anybody for that, but I think they should have taken out uh, 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 a Carrie Fisher first. But 
because they had plans oh. for her to go all, all the way through, right? Yeah. And again, if I'm telling the story, I'm like, it makes more sense to keep Carrie all the way to the end, mm -hmm. which is what they wanted to do, right? And they had a, a really tough time getting through that. My point in bringing that up is Harrison Ford was oddly enough in that as well, yeah. in that consideration, and and he made it through all three movies and uh, was there at the end. But uh, now you have to worry about him in the MCU. So mm. it, it's going to be an issue. I You got to bring in somebody with gravitas, might as well be somebody like him. It's just an age factor. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean... William Hurt really, you know, he didn't have a ton after Incredible Hulk didn't do a ton on screen, but it's still it's a recognizable face and voice and kind of uh, weight that he brings. And if you're going to expand that at all and you don't have him anymore, um, you got to bring in somebody with some some clout. But yeah, age is it's always tough. I mean, Star Wars ran into that. You know, they were lucky when they cast uh, Christopher Lee as Count Dooku. And he made it long enough. He was in his 80s when they cast him. And he managed to be around long enough to do the three movies. But that's a that's a same roll of the dice. Here. Yeah. Yeah, so. same thing. Same All company, right. as it turns yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> they like taking those risks, I guess. I guess. All, alrighty. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for being here. And uh, have a good rest of your night. You too. All right. We'll talk to you later. Good night. Bye. And thank you, folks, for being here tonight. Norm, I know you took off, but uh, thanks, everybody. And we will catch you next time. Bye. Bye.